The lesson this morning is entitled, Is Your Ship on Course? I do appreciate the songs that Jerry led. They have a great deal to do with the lesson this morning. It's based loosely on Hebrews 6, verse 9, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that which is within the veil. The use of an anchor is a nautical term, and it implies a ship. It implies uh, going across the sea or being, being uh, moored in a certain location, anchored in a certain location, as it were, where, where uh, you're safe and you're sure. But this occurs after the trip, or perhaps before the trip, as the case may be. There's many songs in our songbooks about the sea, such songs as the haven of rest, which we just sung. Such songs as Jesus Savior, pilot me, or love lifted me. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult. All of these are songs that make reference to our journey or to our being anchored once we reach the end of the journey or being anchored to the rock, which is Jesus Christ, as the song said. The Bible often uses such similitudes to teach us lessons. The kingdom of heaven is like is found quite often in the scriptures, just in a few few close areas that's very close. It's Matthew 13, verse 31, where the kingdom of God is compared to a grain of mustard seed. We find in Matthew 13, verse 33, just a few verses below that, that is compared to leaven which was hid in, in meal and, and spread. In Matthew 13, verse 44, again, it's compared to a treasure. Matthew 13, verse 45, is compared to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. In Matthew 13, verse 47, it's compared to a fishnet, which brings forth many different kinds of fish. But we want to consider our journey across the sea of life today. And let us look at our ship in this journey is our body. Our cargo is our soul. In Zechariah 12, verse 1, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth from the, forth from the heavens and leth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Sometimes the soul is used as that which was the whole man. But sometimes it's used as the equivalent of the Spirit. It speaks of the Spirit departing man. And it also speaks in the Old Testament, especially the soul departing man at the point of death. And so we have the body and the soul within the body. In Isaiah 26, verse 9, With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth and the inhabitants of the world... Will, will learn righteousness. Here the terms are used interchangeably. Both the spirit and the soul within man, having an interchangeable way of using them, referring to that which is me, which is, which is who I am and what I am, containing my thoughts, my emotions, my consideration, my attitudes. That which is really me is not this shell of the body, but it is my soul. It is my spirit, as it were. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. So it's the spirit of man which is that which really is who and what I am. That determines my personality. That determines the choices I make. So we say that the soul of man is the cargo in this ship. The sea... The sea is the sea of life. It is the water, the, the, the world, as it were, that we live in, the world that we must go through. In John 15, verse 19, we read, If ye were of the world, the world would love its, his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. He's speaking to his apostles, of course, and he's telling them what's to come. They're going to hate you in this world. The world's going to be against you. What's he speaking of? The earth itself? No. He's speaking of the people in the world, the attitude of the world, those things that be of the world as it were. 
In John 17, verse 14, I have given them my word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. What did they do with Jesus? They put him upon the cross. As a matter of fact, it was the very people who should have supported him. John 1, verse 11, he came into his own, and his own received him not. The very ones who should have welcomed Jesus are the very ones who put him upon the cross. And Jesus is saying, I, they, I've chosen them and brought them out of the world, and the world hated them because they're not of the world. Well, were they in the world? Yes. Were they people which needed food? Yes. Clothing? Yes. Shelter? Yes. They needed these things which we consider of the world. But it's speaking of it in a different way, you see. It's speaking of those desires of the world which people have, the worldly nature, the prince of the power of this world, you see, and his influence upon others. As we continue, we read in John 17, verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, in our picture, we have the body being the ship, the soul of the spirit being the cargo, and the sea being the world. Now, what happens if the sea gets in the cargo hold of a transport ship? It can ruin the cargo. It can destroy the cargo, can it? And so it's necessary for us as Christians to keep the sea or the world away from our souls, away from the spirits, our spirit, you see. We must keep it separate from the world, wholly separate from the world. In Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable. Some versions have spiritual service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is he saying? Keep the world out. Don't be like the world. Be transformed, not conformed. The easiest thing to do is to be conformed to the world, to be like the world. We're bombarded with it on television. We're bombarded with it on our music. We're bombarded with it in our books and in our literature. We're bombarded with it many times in the philosophies of those all around us. And it's easy to allow it to get into our cargo hold, to allow it to enter into our, our, our cargo and ruin that cargo, destroy that cargo and spoil it. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12, Now we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are given to us of God. Our spirit is given to us of God. It's not given to us by the devil. It's not given to us by the world. It's given to us by, the God, by God. And we need to deliver that spirit safely to port. And it needs to be the right port. And we don't need to let it be spoiled by the things of the world that's around us. Ephesians 2, verse 2. When in times past you walked, according to the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now we're to walk a different way. Now we're to walk by the spirit which is given to us of God. What does that mean? That means according to his word, by a new attitude, by a new governance. We're to follow Jesus Christ. We're to follow his word. We're to let that rule in our life. Certainly not the spirit of the world, or the attitudes of the world. In Titus 2, verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Soberly, righteously, and godly. How are we to live? Separate from the world, different than the world. The world may mock, the world may laugh, the world may try to persuade us. The world tries to get into our soul, into our cargo hole, and it tries to spoil the cargo. But what do we learn here? What do we see? We see a cargo that we're to keep safe. 
It means we're not to let those worldly things enter in. We're to live righteously, godly in this present world. James 1, verse 27, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fathers of widows in their affliction. Now listen, and to keep himself unspotted by the world. Someone brings you some, a nice coat. Brother Delbert just bought a new suit. Looks at that suit and it looks nice and clean. It don't have any stains on it. I look at I don't see a single coffee stain on that suit. You know it? It's brand new, dusty. Nice suit. Now, if it had been full of coffee stains, and if it had been full of jam and jelly stains and things like that, I really don't think he would have bought it. <laughs> he wouldn't have accepted it, you see. Now, we don't want our cargo spoiled by, by being stained and spotted by the things of this world. We want it delivered safe. We want it to, to be delivered in pristine condition, you see. In James 1, verse 27, keep yourself unspotted from the world. James 4, verse 4, the friendship of the world is enmity with God. We're going to be, we have to make choices. Some choices are hard. Sometimes we want to hold on to the world with one hand, hold on to God with the other hand. We can't do it. Time after time, Rick who stood up here giving illustration after illustration of people who say they're a Christian and then they curse or they say things and do things they shouldn't be doing. Friend, that's what it's talking about. You can't hold on to the world with one hand and hold on to God with the other. You have to make decisions. Sometimes those decisions are difficult to make because the world, oh, it has a siren call. Let's see, was it the Iliad or the Odyssey in which the captain of the ship had him tied, himself tied to the mast so the sirens wouldn't lure him into the rocks and to the destruction? that was on their island, made the other people stop their ears so they couldn't hear the siren song. He said, I want to hear it, even though it could lure us to our destruction. I'm going to have you tie me. And thus he saved himself. But friends, we have to stop our ears to the siren call of the world. We have to control ourselves. And it's like a siren call. It's beautiful. It sounds good. It sounds wonderful. And it lures people. And for a while, it's so very pleasant until the destruction comes. In James 4, verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? You can't, you can't be friends of the world with God at the same time. You just cannot do it. Now, we've been told in the past that the world and the church are coming closer and closer. But we need to remember the true fact is is that the world hasn't moved. Not really. Talk about homosexuality. We read of it in the Bible, don't we? Talk about adultery. We read of it in the Bible. Talk about fornication. We read of it in the Bible, don't we? The sins that we're seeing so prevalent in America today is not something new. It's been prevalent in nations and countries before. Look at Rome and the, the way that Rome had fallen into, into the, the Greek philosophy, hedonism, and how effective it was in, in influencing the people of that time. That's why Paul had to admonish the the, the Romans and the Corinthians as much as he did to avoid those sins that they had been in in the past. Even their worship of their false gods was a worship often filled with filth and sin in God's eyes, discounting the fact it was idolatry. Friend, we have to keep in mind that if the church and the world is getting closer together, it's the church, quote, unquote, that's moved, not the world. And as the church moves closer and closer, it's headed toward the rock. Well, it is destroying itself when it does so. The voyage 
It's our Christian life. And we have to realize that like many a voyage, it's not an easy voyage. And it can be filled with danger as well. In Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, Enter ye into the straight gate. That word straight doesn't mean straight like a line, but it means straight as in difficult and hard. Straight of Gibraltar comes to mind, doesn't it? Difficult area to, to go through for a ship. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. May there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be which find it. Friends, we can sail the, seven, we can sail the sea of life, and we can go with the flow. That's an old expression, isn't it? Go with the flow. And we can wind up on the rocks of destruction. Or we can go the way God has set forth in his chart, the word of God. You know, these old sailors, they had charts. Charts that told them the safe passages, the difficult passages, where the rocks and the shoals were. Charts that would lead them to the destination that they wanted to go, made by explorers that went before them and tradesmen that went before them. They had those charts, and they used those charts. And we have a chart as well, and it's right here. It's the Word of God. It can take us to a safe port. That safe port is heaven. If we'll just use the chart that God has given us. Yes, it's a difficult way. It's a narrow way. But it's charted out for us in His Word. We have a way that leads to life. We're promised that. In Mark 10, verse 30, Jesus said, Ye shall receive a hundredfold now in this life, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands, but listen to this, with persecutions. With persecutions. Friend, that tells me that the, the sea that we travel is a dangerous sea. It's not only difficult and hard, but it's filled with persecution. Those who would destroy us, those who would rob us of our cargo. Pirates, as it were, those who follow Satan, may not even know that they're following Satan, but they are, and they'll lead us astray. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, we're told that all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer what? Persecution. Friend, it's coming. If we sail these seas and we sail toward the port that God wants us to land on, the safe port, then we're going to have to deal with persecution. We're going to have to deal with suffering. Verse 2 Timothy 2, verse 12, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Oh, the, the, the glory at the end of the path, the glory at the end of the voyage is worth it. Fair haven of rest. Paul landed at a place called Fair Haven where they sought shelter from the storm. Indeed, we need, we need to realize that there is a safe shelter. And we need to realize that we might have to pass through storms and persecutions and trials and attacks, but there is a home waiting for us. If we'll just deliver our cargo there. Revelation 2 verse 10. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried. Now listen. And ye shall suffer tribulation ten days. That doesn't mean a literal ten days. It just means tribulation to, to, to the fullest. Be thou faithful unto death. Now that word unto is the same Greek word you find in Acts 2, 38, translated for. Be thou faithful from one state into another state. That's the idea. You're going to be persecuted. You stay faithful even if it brings you from being alive into death. And I will do what? Give you a crown of life. Friend, the voyage is a difficult voyage, but there's a crown of life waiting, isn't there? 1 Peter 3, verse 10 says, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no God. The thing I'm trying to get across is, even though there's all these troubles, trials, and tribulations, <laughs> there's a lot of joy there too. There's a lot of happiness on that voyage of life for the Christian. It's not all hardships and troubles 
There's joy. There's joy and peace that we find in our Lord as we journey through the sea of life. Our anchor is our hope. Hope is produced by expectation and desire. In, Revel, in Romans 8, I got that from you, Dad. Romans 8, verse 24, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man saith, why doth he yet hope for? It's not something we, we've seen already. We're headed to a shore that we haven't seen. Sometimes because we haven't seen it, and we can see the pleasures around us and the things around us, we're tempted to get off course and go and stop at the, at the nearest island of pleasure, stop at the nearest island of temptation. But we can't do that. We have to keep going. There's a shore that's waiting for us, a better shore, a shore that we hope for, and we... Look for that hope. We expect it, and we desire it, and we can't be distracted from it, you see. We have to keep our eyes on the goal. In Hebrews 6, verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope that was set before us. Friends, we have to keep on keeping on. We trust in God's promise. We trust in God's chart. We trust in God's word. And it can take us there. We have that hope. You know, if we abandon hope, we give up, don't we? What did the people of Israel do when they were going through the wilderness and trouble would come? Sometimes they'd say, let's go back to Egypt. Sometimes people abandon hope. And they want to return. We can't afford to do that in our voyage. Well, what is that hope that we have? Is it a hope just for a better life, although we do enjoy a better life? No. Is it that hope that uh, we'll have peace on earth? No, although the Christian does enjoy peace on earth in the sense that he has peace with God, he has peace with those around him, he has an inner peace that comes from the forgiveness of sins. No. Well, what is that hope? Well, Titus 1 verse 2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. That is our hope. And Romans the 8th chapter says, Hope that is seen is not hope. We do not in fullness possess eternal life now. We possess it in promise. We possess it in hope. We possess it in the eye of faith, as it were. But we do not actually possess it at this time. We're living in hope of it. And so we keep, keep towing. We keep rowing. We keep sailing across this sea of life in hope of heaven itself. The atheist, however, has absolutely no hope. <laughs> Matter of fact, they don't even have an anchor. But you know what? He's going somewhere. He's going where the wind and the storms blow him, isn't he? And friend, I guarantee you, I don't want to go there. He can drift with the waves and he can go with the wind. But I don't want to go where he's going. I've got hope. I've got a promise. If I follow the chart, which the atheist isn't doing, if I follow that chart, I'll reach my port. <coughs> but the port that the, that the atheist is being blown to is not a safe port at all. It's a port full of torment <laughs> and trials. It's a port full of anguish. In Psalm 53, verse 1, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They, have, they, they are corrupt. They have done abominable iniquities. There is none that do, doeth good. The cable, my friend, you've got a cable that ties the, the anchor to the ship. You can't just throw the anchor over, can you? You've got to have the cable. Well, what's the cable? The cable here is faith. You have to have that faith. Our hope is dependent upon our faith. Without faith, there would be absolutely no hope, would there? Because we believe, 
we hope. And because we hope, we're not swept away with every wind of trouble or of error that comes along. Remember the parable of the seed that fell among the thorns in Luke the 8th chapter? The cares and the uh, and riches and pleasures of this life led him astray, caused that seed to die, didn't it? Sometimes that can happen on our journey of life. The cares and the pleasures of life lead people astray. And they don't stay on the, they don't follow the chart and they get lost as a result. In Luke 8, verse 13, we read of how during times of temptation, that which fell among the rocks died. Well, the same thing is true. Sometimes whenever people are on this journey and, and they, they're, they're going toward the safe port, the trials and the pressures of life cause them to go astray, cause them to lose the direction that they should be going. Our faith is in God and His Word. Ephesians 4, verse 4, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Why? Because God has given us His chart. We follow that chart. We have faith in that chart. And it'll lead us to heaven. And that's the way the ship must go if it's to be safe and sure. Faith is the victory. And only through faith can we have the victory. In 1 John 5, verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. An anchor needs a cable, and faith is that cable. If it breaks, if our faith breaks, then what happens? Our ship drifts, doesn't it? It falls into the rocks or into the dangerous area and our soul, our cargo, is destroyed. Let's notice the journey. We've mentioned that it has dangers, has joys, has obstacles, temptations, battles, persecutions, and storms. Mark 10, verse 29 and 30, I'm not going to read it all. We've already mentioned some of the things, houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, and then it says, with persecutions in the world to come, eternal life. I want to reach that port of eternal life. We must safely reach the port. John 14, verses 1 through 4 says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Oh, friend, that's the port I want to reach. I want to be there with Jesus. I want to be there with God. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 says, For we know that for earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I want to reach heaven. That's where I want my port to be. I don't want it to be in hell. I don't want it to be that location. I want the safe port of heaven. Itself. 1 Peter 1 verse 4 says to an in, in, inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. You know, when I buy a car, I know that that car will eventually wear out. I know that it's not going to last me forever. And if it lasts me, it won't last my children or whoever gets it out after me or after them. There's going to come a time when it'll be no good any longer. Simply a fact of material things. I know that no matter how nice of a house I may own, how nice of a house I may buy or build, that it will someday go downhill. It will someday be destroyed. I know that if I were to go down to Lowe's today, buy all new appliances, all new countertops, and bring that kitchen up to the 2017 style, that in 2018 it'll be out of date. <laughs> I realize these things. And I realize that these things that we have in this life are not eternal. Whatever I might have, whatever I might take 
pride in in this life is absolutely nothing. But the heavenly things are forever. I can take those things with me. The things that we might do for others, the teaching of the gospel to others, the saving of souls because we've taught them the gospel. These are things that will go with us into eternity. Our worship to God will go with us into eternity. But these things that I buy with dollars and cents that I use up and then later cast away or they go downhill, they don't last. They're here for a moment and then they're gone. Friend, we need to look for that eternal home in heaven. There's an inheritance waiting for, there, for us there that never grows old, that never dies. That port, heaven itself, what a glorious port, home in heaven at last. And so we ask, where is your ship going? The Christian journey is indeed full of storms and trials, but it also has wonderful blessings and joys even in this life. The cargo's precious and it's truly tragic whenever that cargo's lost. Jesus once asked, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 11, the last few verses. But the port itself is a glorious port. You'll be delivering your precious cargo to a place of joy, a place of peace, a place of happiness that's greater than anything ever known or experienced here upon this earth. Is your anchor strong? Is your cable of faith sufficient? We need to determine to deliver our cargo safely to heaven's fair shore. Now what do you have to do to ensure your cargo is safe? Well, first of all, you must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 8, 34. Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. That's not quite the verse I was wanting, is it? <laughs> Let's move to another verse. Let's go to Mark 16, verse 15. We all know that one. Jesus told his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What did he say? He that believeth. Belief is a condition of salvation, and you cannot get around it. I believe the verse I was looking for a while ago was John 8, verses 31 and 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We have to believe and know that truth. We have to hear it first. Then repent of our sins. Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. And the times of this ignorance God once winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, hath given assurance unto all men and that he hath raised him from the dead. We must confess Jesus Christ. John 10, verses 32 and 33. He said here, uh, <laughs> he said here that with the mouth confessed is made unto salvation. If you, do, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If, if, if you don't confess me, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father which is in heaven. I said, John, that's Matthew. In Mark 16, 15 and 16, he not only said, believe, those who believe and are baptized shall be saved, but those who are baptized. We talked about faith in that verse. Now we're talking about baptism. What do you have to do if you want to be saved? Well, you have to believe, be baptized. What are the other things that we mentioned here? But what do you have to do in this verse if you want to be lost? Well, just don't believe. It's that simple. It's that simple. Friend, after that, we're washed away. We're a new creature. We've begun the journey toward a safe port. But then we must be faithful, even unto death. First John 1, verse 7 says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. That tells me something. That tells me if I want to appear before God in the judgment, pure from my sins, having them forgiven, that I need to walk in the light. And what is the light? That's God's word. It's God's word. Well, the lessons are. 
Are you on the journey? Are you following the chart that God has given us? Are you drifting here and drifting there, letting the winds of desire, pleasure, whatever, move you one way or the other? How strong is your anchor? Will it hold during the storms and troubles of life? Will it keep you safe and secure? Is your faith, that cable to that anchor, secure? Are you letting the water of the sea of life, the water of the world, damage your cargo, which is your soul? If you're subject to Christ's invitation, and you wish to begin that journey, that safe journey toward a safe harbor, home in heaven, then come, all together we stand.